Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you to Anais, Kamya, and John. Um, this week has been really amazing. Um, and I've just had a really great time during the residency, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, and so I'm going to start um, with the prologue, um, and then I'm going to delve in to kind of what I've been working on um, during my time here. When we abandoned the demonym American for the more specific statesir, we did so to make sense of a convoluted national identity. We imagined a more precise name, and one commiserate in phonetics with a national self-image of agility, efficiency, and pluck. We imagined something sporty and lean, something that suggested direction and speed. But more so, we wanted to acknowledge the many different states in which we each resided, scattered every which way, here and there, conflicted by the hierarchical divisions colonialism had produced. With this new name, we attempted to grapple with the presumption inherent to the concept of the singular nation state, a presumption of which many of us remained dubious and by which many of us remained endlessly confused, that we somehow, by some logic, were all supposed to represent one body. One perk of reparations, infrastructure, we file back into cities we've been pushed out of, renovating, repopulating, building businesses protected against the overcast of franchises and corporations with taxes and zoning laws. Our cities shimmer and hum, real symbols of something great, though it's too early to say what exactly. As new buildings go up, regulations limit size, style, and color to counter the aesthetic disasters of the gentrification era. Our new apartments fit with the, with the original architecture of these cities, updated where necessary to serve contemporary needs. We tire of material things, especially new material things, and thrift for our wardrobes. We oppose the hard gloss of suburban sprawl from which the bougier of us escaped and at which the less bougie once raised a brow. We glorify the impact of, we glorify the compact and lived in, our apartments are humble and fresh, and so are our lives. There are more people of color in the cities than white. There are enough of them that, we, that they can't really be considered a, minor, a minority, but it's clear that they are from one stroll down any block. Amongst the population at large stand firm believers in separatism, secession, reactionary negation, but the majority of us mix with general accord. Some moments are seamless, others produce friction. Violence is rare, but does occur. The resulting outcry has made these incidences less common. We call ourselves Afro-statesers because national identity, true national identity, is experiential documentation of a nation's people's attempts to, to survive in that nation. Reconceiving ideas of land ownership means black and native people get what we need and those with excess handed over. To curb violent backlash, the welfare states expanded with what the government pays back to us. So poor and middle-class whites benefit too, though they turn to disbelief to deal with their anger toward our, toward our prioritization. Don't start with that, they say. You really believe that? Perhaps it's better this way. A U.S. of cities in rebirth is a U.S. finally honest about not knowing who it is. We enter this era uncertain, terrified, and ecstatic. Zeal ranges from nomic to violent. States are means different states, but together. All the artists moved to this city, where I live, out of nostalgia for a fallen metropolis, a romance for rust and grit and prolific genius rising up from it. Media people follow the artist. The Afro-Staters envision a possibility to live out the transition from Americanness to statesterhood. We are, not, we are not the only black people, but the first to move here, making default the ideology we bring with us, like a state filling with blue or red. Some say this makes us very ahead as a city, Others say it makes us very backwards, and still others say it makes us very behind. Those of us that swap American for Statser do so out of a commitment to what we consider undeniable. We do not believe we belong to anywhere other than where we know, and narrow our eyes at any proposition of a return to somewhere else. We're, we primarily theorize and critique, more deeply invested in the possibilities of mundane, quiet subversions than outward and boisterous ones, which we distrust. Nor do we commercialize our intellect and personal experiences, avoiding buzzwords, slogans, and any phrases that can be whittled down to a headline. We become verbose people, 
full of delayed and lingering responses. States or identity appeals to us for its resistance to speed toward drastic action while demanding all to reconceptualize and rethink. The term revolutionary is now acknowledged for its precise meaning, one that overthrows, rather than applied to everyone, ev rather than applied to every action or acknowledgement of truth. The revolutionaries see the U.S.'s crimes against people of color as irredeemable and scoff at our, the Afro-statesers, insistence on identifying with this country. Afro-statesers and revolutionaries, while we weren't looking, have managed to complicate how we see black. Differentiations in dress, language, and cultural production emerge under the umbrella of different political ideologies, and now we can tell each other apart from a glance. The Afro-statesers ignore accusations of assimilation. We understand these accusations as a narrow lens through which peers conceive of us. Hatnaha is a fictional island nation about the size of Great Britain and located 600 miles south of Cape Town, South Africa in the South Atlantic. The island exists in an alternate reality of the contemporary world and has, throughout its history, avoided colonization from outside forces, though no explanation is given into how. Inhabitants come in varied shades of black. Few grow their hair long, most are bald. In Bot, the most populous of Hatnaha's cities, hip locals grow unibrows, and if they can't grow them, draw them on. Because our cities are new, we all aspire to create our own Bot. I think this is one reason the Hatnaha online comic series is so popular amongst the young and the black. We want a metropolis, a new one built from who we are, or are trying to be. The last Monday of every month, the author releases a new issue of the comic on their website. It's all any of us discuss the entire day. What's going to happen with the characters? A type of dramedy as science fiction. The elaborate maps, the descriptions, the invented language all make us believe in the possibility of imagining something else. This place, Hatnaha, is so different, but it feels so real. Some of us have learned Hatnahans, the Hatnaha language, and incorporated into our casual interactions. Una, instead of hello. Taksi Hanan, instead of I'll text you back. Klinu, for be back soon. The Afro-Staters accuse the revolutionaries of rejecting the inevitable diversity across the spectrum of black experience in favor of a romanticized ideal based on a misreading of African history and anecdotal platitudes. The, Afro the revolutionaries in the other corner accuse the Afro-Staters of a hyper-intellectual disconnection from the reality of lived experience, present danger, and a, and a naive faith in a fantastical ideal dependent on the acceptance of white people. In Hatnaha's oceanic climate, warm days and cool nights tremble with gusts of wind that chill hard when they hit you. A cool rain season surges through June, July, and August. In the Hatnaha language, the concepts of black and darkness share the same term, though the connotations differ from that in English. In English, blackness is associated with darkness, and so the color carries with it the mostly negative or sinister characteristics of this abstract noun. In their language, however, Darkness is associated with blackness, and, experience, and experiencing visual darkness is associated with experiencing a mutation of the color black, a condition stripped of stimuli and so truthful and direct. Since reparations have made all of us rethink our national identity, the young and black find ourselves too curious and energetic to suppress feelings of not knowing what's happening. Our parents take to this confusion with routine, a way to provide order, something to hold on to. To fulfill our ambitions for self-understanding, we seek a metropolis commiserate in density and speed with our zeal for possibility. We want a place of cinematic character, magical moments of chance and coincidence, of casual glamour. Because we scatter, we fail to concoct the metropolis of our dreams, the place that will assure us we, we needn't look further. We want to find a home, and we believe this home to be somewhere, somewhere we, all black people, can be together. We seek a metropolis to confirm racial unity, but we're realizing how complex we really are. When racial unity fails to formulate as we hope, the Hatnaha comics remind us of the similarities amongst our visions. Hatnaha publishes at hatnaha.tad. Tad is a shorthand for tadu, the language's word for an active connection amongst many things, as well as for the internet. It's in its breakthrough first season, so fandom is obsessive and pundit commentary is fascinated and perplexed. A comic, a free online comic, this is what did it. This is what's touched the young black masses. 
The comic's three protagonists each live in one of, of the three districts or stuck suns of Hatnaha's metropolis. Gama is a circular island afloat in the country's northeast sea, about 240 square miles. A bay hugs Gama with about a mile of water between it and the mainland. From the shore and heading inland, city limits designate an area about 500 square miles, shaped like a southwest reaching oval. This expanse divides down the middle with Bugu on the northwest side and Gi on the southeast side. Four million live in Gi and Gama, respectively. Gi inhabitants live temperate but agile lives, easygoing and socially active. Gama inhabitants live slow, small lives, decelerated by lower density and detachment from the mainland. Bugu, the most populous, contains a motley mix of seven million people. Its inhabitants, particularly those active in its energized street culture, are known for their distinct accents, quick and wide, so that they, they chomp the air when they speak. Together, these districts form Bot, the metropolis. Together, Bugu and Gi make up Mazuha, the mainland region of the Bot metropolis. Fly above and look down to a grid of millions of tightly packed, coolly colored, cube-shaped buildings built of large, craggy bricks and undulating over the hills. From, from the mainland center, a pinwheel of 55 multi-lane avenues shoot outward and slice up vast areas of these two-story structures. Built with just about five feet between them, streets prohibit travel by car, leaving the avenues for all above-ground motorized traffic. Bikes start and, and feet hustle through the narrow alley streets amongst the purple-blue, green, blue-green, and gray and gray structures. With blinds drawn open, wide windows spill the interior world out into the public. From every roof sprouts a, a lush garden of local flora, vines dri drizzling between, the, between and down the brick. The bustle of a neighborhood usually depends on how commercial and residential units mix. In Bugu, they mix in every neighborhood, commercial usually on the ground floor or occupying an entire structure. At storefronts, plaques designating the businesses lay flat against the facade. Some ground floors, doorless and open to the street, lead down a flight of stairs to the Sniku, Bot's underground public transportation system. Their language has no gender, and so neither do any of the people that speak it. No words for boy or girl, man or woman, only a term for newborn, Buma, baby, Gaba, a single term for child, teenager, young adult, Husa, and a term for elder, Nima. They're less concerned with age, as adulthood is seen as, as idealistic, but perhaps a necessary ideal. One should always aim for their most calculated sober self, but to fall short only attests to one's humanity. It becomes increasingly easy to get lost in Hatnaha when our cities fail to match our hopes. Maybe I don't mean this in a defeatist way. We look to the comics, consciously or subconsciously, as a blueprint. Published under the pen name Nada, the native language's word for translator or mediator, the comics author is otherwise totally anonymous. No one knows who they are, where they live, or, or why they write. There is no knowing of when they will stop, and if they stop, whether they will begin again. The revolutionaries see the Afrostaters as centrist, conformist, and unambitious. The Afrostaters see the revolutionaries as reactive, misguided, and extreme. While emphasizing continental African languages in their teachings, the revolutionaries began to hybridize features of the languages they studied with English. This process produced We Talk, developed in primarily racially monolithic context and featuring phonetics, tenses, and vocabulary from African-American vernacular English, intermixed with grammatical structures and loanwords from Spanish and a variety of Caribbean, Creole, and Niger-Congo languages. Afro-States or English features a number of loanwords from Spanish, Caribbean Creole, such as Jamaican Patois and Bayesian Creole, native, language such, native languages such as Ojibwa and Navajo, and cadences and grammar from African-American vernacular English. While standard American English speakers can understand Afro-States or English, we talk lacks and interintelligibility. We call ourselves Afro-Staters because national identity, true national identity, is an understanding of its inevitable fluidity and precariousness. We, util we, do, we utilize it to keep record of who we once were. We call, themselves the, we call them the traditionalists, but they still call themselves Americans, black Americans when specifying. It may be a miscalculation to say they make up most of the black people in the states, but there are certainly many of them, and of all races, still using what some consider an outdated demonym. They reject the label political, speak standard American English, and align quite closely with mass post-reparations American culture. 
Afro-statesters descend from integrationists that considered integration and opportunity in American identity as, an undeni as undeniably, undeniably their own, but aimed toward accuracy. They replaced black with Afro to acknowledge Africa, but joined it to statesor to hint at heritage rather than suggest a direct linkage. The compound meshes the two words together, one a prefix and so slightly distant, the other its whole and so more immediate, but both of them inseparable from each other. In Bot, the Gama districts connect to the mainland with the mile-long, multi-lane bridge and four, four sneaku lines that run beneath the water. Residents inhabit wide-set, three-story structures built with rich red-purple and blue-green timbers. Eaves encompass and overhang both floors of, so that the buildings resemble stacked, wide-brim hats. They come cylindrical or cube-shaped with scenic windows and flat roofs billowing with garden life. Four or five sit in a row on a snug, narrow island of grass. One island makes a long, lean block. Blocks repeat on a grid aimed northwest, northeast to southwest. Scattered bicyclists glide down wide, one, two, one and two two-way streets, a safe distance from nearby cars. As you head northeast toward the shore, buildings narrow, compress, and multiply, six, seven, eight to a block, and transition from exclusively residential to a mix of residential and commercial to only commercial until you reach the boardwalk. Nada's only other known work, a short story titled Kenyana, about a mountainous island nation of the same name in the Mediterranean where the Gulf of Lyon and Ligurian and Balearic seas meet. About the size and shape of Crete, 70% of the island's 5 million inhabitants descend from West Africans that arrived and remained largely isolated there from the 5th century onward. Of these 5 million, 3 million live in the dense capital city, Gua, that spans about 35 miles through a grassy valley. Sharp blue skies do up with the green rising up and around the city, beyond the skyline of white buildings with their red and green tiled roofs. The Kenyana people speak Kenyananu, a romance language like the others, descended from vulgar Latin. Its Bantu influence, phonetics, and grammar, however, make it distinct from its cousins. Of the aforementioned black factions, we are not the only ones, us Afro-Staters. There are many, many more, scattered, as I've said, across the land. The most adventurous of us, it's rumored, have escaped into the rural south to live lives off the grid. I've more than once thought to escape, too, to see if I find them. Who is we? かかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかかか
Tinga zing tan de ha. Dan si ma zing se. Tinga chen de ze ke ne ne ha ke. Ka na ikan ha mi gana da za azun se. Ma zi ma zi. Dan si ma zi se. Ka di se ka da ka hun su tu ha. Kada guhuns, kada guhuns. Ti azun. Iki ha, ika azun sa daza, kadi sa kada guhuns sa tuk. Ti guzun an snag, ti guzun an snag. Kadi sa kada guhuns su tuk. Ake gi hen snag aze mazi ha. Kakazi, Kakazi dun hanuksa, Kakaduksu ha de na ka, Nunans azunsu tuk duns nana, Nunans azunsu tuk tikans zakun sida, Tikat zakun sida, Tikat zaku sida, Uksaha, Uksaha, Tikati hamansa kana. Tikati han tana ha hisu tu kana ha han haksa ditsa ha nansa han ha han haksa ditsa ha nansa han ha migini azan ki ha pinak han ha pagat skatuksa hisu ba kakasa skatuksa hisu ba kakasa Ska tuksu hisu ba ka gasa uksa ha. Mazi mazi. Ka ka nangs hisu ki gasa. Da da ka du da. Zik dun se ki dan su tsu ka ksun su. Dun se da kun se. Dun se a zun se ki. Ka ka zi na ak. Dans azun se, tuazi dun se kik, ka muze tuk se, deze kene tuk nak se. Kakazi dun hanuk se, katka duk se ha de nak ka. When the Europeans began their colonial conquest, Hatnaha remained uninvaded but vigilant in protecting itself against, against attack. While, while relatively safe and self-sufficient with its abundance of vegetation and natural resources, the island ultimately began to transform into somewhere entirely different. For centuries, violent storms encircling the island made it unapproachable by ship. But by the 19th century, new routes and technologies meant people from the outside could reach its shores and those from the inside became curious about life beyond their verdant and isolated paradise. Amongst European colonization, it, it became clear that to protect itself, the Hatnaha people would need to construct an image of power and clout legible enough to Europeans to, for, to intimidate them and keep them away. Hatnahan speaking community leaders in the territory of Bat, the most populous region, gathered and constructed something like a national government to administer the land. Ideas of unity, oneness, and order. Ideas, ideas of unity, oneness, and order meant every meant everyone meant everyone learned the hot and hot language. Oh my God, so sorry. I have this like feature on my computer that like helps me fall asleep. So I'm gonna turn it off. Ah, one sec. Slight intermission. Uh, disable until sunrise. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're back in business. I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, ideas of unity, oneness, and order meant everyone learned the Hatnahans language. 
in Gizunans, or their equivalent of schools across the island, even those whose native language was one of the other three spoken there. A military or something similar was constructed by merging local plata, a term used to describe people who had initially been put in place to prevent territory wars, like those of the island's history. These plata were given uniforms, weaponry, and instructed in combat. The seven densely populated centers scattered across the Hatanaha Island and its two smaller islands off the southeast coast adopted personas of cities, a concept quite foreign to Hatanaha, but useful in constructing an image of efficiency and enterprise. The, the concept of city did not translate easily into Hatanahans, and so the word hees, a term that roughly translates to gathering place, now served this function. This phrase, hees gasa, describes the seven cities. Densely populated regions occupied by 95% of the country's inhabitants from a centuries old tradition of protecting the land by leaving it largely uninhabited, save those regions reserved for the wealthy farming class. This ideology, the, new, the newly formed Hatnaha government understood as antithetical to the greed and violence of European conquest, and so were determined to preserve it. Before this shift, the island of Hatnaha had no uniform name and derived its new name from the old word Hatna which simply expressed the concept of people wor who work together. Ideas of a uniform national identity, that those who didn't homogenize easily stood out. For, city further, for cities further from the Bat metropolis, such as Kanhanha, geographical distance meant that regional accents emerged and made clear who was from where. This, at first, resulted in lighthearted rivalries, but these rivalries, rivalries soon, soon grew, into severe, grew in severity as the government enforced extraordinary taxes on rural land that made moving outside these cities nearly impossible, except for the farmers who had always been there. Immersed in cities, city dwellers are often uncertain of the economic well-being of their country, consumed by a speed and density that obscures outside activity and causes a disinterest in and skepticism of anything beyond their limits, especially anything Western. In the Hatnaha language, Hatnahans, all words consist of a stem and a suffix that alters its grammatical function, making certain words that may be unrelated in English share etymological roots. For example, the, the verb for to study, does a kappa, well, the, wor the verb for to study is does a kappa, while the, ver while the word does a ka, which when translated literally could mean studier or study person, is used to mean lover, or a friend with whom intellectual and physical bonds are shared, examined, and contemplated. Polyamory is not a concept that startles Hatnaha natives, for marriage and monogamy are two concepts that never appeal to them. Many have many lovers, many love many lovers all at once, sharing their physical needs and desires amongst all of them and going to each sat to satisfy different urges and fantasies. Because the concept of gender also has also never appealed to them, genitals are understood as individual characteristics similar to facial features. Inner thighs, areola, armpits, and sphincters are popular fixations amongst Hatnaha residents who shamelessly discuss and show off these body parts in cafes and bars when attracted to someone and interested in feeling them out with their toes, fingers, and tongues. In the summer months of December, January, and February, locals lather themselves in various oils and roam naked through the streets and down beaches. Upon identifying mutually consensual, mutually consensual partners, they fuck openly and publicly as their vibrant black skin glistens in the sunlight. This ritual, called duvance, which roughly translates to embodiment or knowing, has origins many centuries old with the intent of celebrating skin and energy, but has since been upheld as a rejection of Western reservations around the body and a method for maintaining open dialogue around sexual health. It has never occurred to, occurred to many locals to relegate such glorious activities to bedrooms with, with closed doors and shuttered windows. So this is why people your age like this, my dad remarks, the sex. I shrug, maybe. I think that's what it is, my mom adds, but the language thing is interesting. I've taken a break from reading to explain to my parents the cultural landscape of this world, of this comic they hear so much about but have never read themselves. Say more about the language. You seem to speak it very well, my dad says, so I continue. In Hatnahans, as I said before, all words consist of a stem and a suffix that alters its grammatical function or semantic meaning. While verb, while verb infinitives end in apa, one can replace this ending to change the mood, the mood of the verb, though in the language, tenses do not exist. The four, the four verb moods include indicative, or expressing a simple statement or fact, subjunctive, 
expressing something imagined or wished for, potential, expressing what's possible or capable, and imperative, expressing a command. Among, among moods, verb endings ch change according to grammatical person while making no distinction between singularity and plurality. So the verb endings for the first person singular I and the first person plural we are the same, as are that for the third person singular and the third person plural. Aba, to go. Ta, I, we go. U, I, we would go. Liha, I, we could go. Leek, let's go. Because of the function of the, of the verb stem, verbs can easily become nouns and vice versa. For example, while nagapa means to trust or confide in, the noun naga means friend and naguns means trust or camaraderie, which brings us to noun classes and cases. Nouns and hatnahans come in eight different classes or categories specified by their endings. Inanimate objects, animate objects and experiences, animals and insects, people, human built and natural locations, abstractions and concepts, sensations and characteristics, and activities and languages. So because the a the, uh, ending denotes a person, naga means, fr naga means friend, uh, while the ending uns denoting an abstraction or concept denotes trust or camaraderie, all produced from the root nug, which is underlined. Similarly, uh, the verb bapa means to step on, while box means shoe, boo means foot, and bunts means shoe store. Technological objects alternate between the ox ending for inanimate objects and the oo ending for animate objects and experiences, depending on whether they are turned on or in use or turned off or dormant. While kubu talks, while kubu talks and mabox refer to a computer that is turned on in a parked car respect, respectively, Kubutu and Mabu refer to a computer being used and a car being driven. Noun cases indicate the grammatical function of a verb. Cases in Hatnahans include the nominative case, indicating the subject of the verb, the accusative, the accusative case, indicating the direct object of the verb, the dative and benefactive case, indicating the indirect object of a verb or the, or the noun for which something is done, and the instrumental and committative case, or the noun, and the, or the noun with which something is done. While English is, is, what, is what's called an SOV language, meaning the sentence order is subject, object, verb, Hatnahans is the VOS language, meaning the sentence order is verb, object, subject. So, namatsmas, which means the cat eats, literally is eats cat. Sana uh, namaksa masuki, which literally would be feed food to cat I. Bansa masa nagani ki, care for cat with friend I, or I care for the cat with my friend. To pluralize a noun, simply elongate the first vowel. While distinctions between long and short vowels do not exist in English, they do not, de they do, they do not determine English. Do, uh, okay. uh, while distinctions between long and short vowels do exist in English, they do not determine meaning. For example, the O in lot is short, while the O in long in, is long. Lot, long. The A in bat is short, while the A in bag is long. Hear it? Bat, bag. So, namatmas, the cats eat. Sana namaksa masu ki, we feed food to the cats. Bansa masa nagani ki, we care for the cats with friends. And this is the discussion with my parent. This is, this is my discussion with my parent as I pack my lunch for me and Camille's trip to see the African burial ground monument. I haven't been out to the suburbs in months, but decided to make one last visit before I moved north to work on music with my friend Devin. The buses shuttle from the dense city into Virginia's vast expanse of road and natural trap in, in, in nature. The buses that shuttle from the dense city into Virginia's vast expanse of road and nature travel highways that once permitted privately owned cars. Since reparations, initiatives to preserve air quality mean these new suburbs are only accessible by public transportation. Dad tells me of the neighborhoods once inhabited by suburban black folks like me and Camille, embodying their hopes in their lawns, cars, and salary jobs. He tells me of the black suburb in Maryland and the exoduses into, out of, and back into the city as inequities made living precarious and unstable. 
He tells me of our ancestors who found, who found the site of this burial ground behind an elementary school, who identified it and had a plaque made before reparations funded monuments to be built so that history could no longer pass without recognition. Since suburban housing developments have been raised for reforestation and the most garish of big mansions converted into art studios and performance spaces, a suburban landscape of franchises and minivans would, would seem unfathomable if it weren't for photographs, writings, and oral histories. Mom and dad remember times before DC's borders were redrawn to form a complete diamond and incorporate the stretch of Northern Virginia where I grew up. They remember times when isolation was ideal and promises of excess the catalyst. When the environment was at our disposal and this, and this disposal helped distance us from histories that caused too much pain to bear, that revealed too much complexity for many to discuss without defensiveness and crises. I pack a picnic in the kitchen of my family's apartment in Arlington, DC and await Camille's arrival. The bus stops just one block up the street and will soon take us southward, southward, southward. When I ask my parents of their experience growing up as, part, as a part of the transition generation, the 30-some the 30 years it took to reconceive and enact the shape and functions of banks, governments, and concepts of land ownership, they use three words that stick out to me. Messy, promising, wondrous. Something so new only a combination of fear and awe felt appropriate. And now here, and now here we are. Monuments for the Dogue tribe. Monuments for the Africans that arrived at Jamestown in, in the late August of 1619. Monuments for their descendants. Monuments for all the people for whom this dream was not their own, but whose ambitions for something different helped the world realize the dangers of ego, the faults of individualism, and the functions of power. New monuments to replace those we finally realized had to be taken down. Thank you.